Hey, good morning, everybody. I hope you, are, you guys are all excited, as I am, about discussing this uh, new trend, chat GPT, AI, and all that. And I also hope that you have your cup of coffee or tea uh, early in the morning. All right, with us, let's uh, kick this off. So before we begin, let me just give a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ahmed Abu Garbia, and I am uh, based in Chicago. My day job is basically incident handling, DevOps, uh, mostly in the cloud. And I teach the SEC 540 and the SEC 535 person. Both of these classes talk about like cloud security, DevOps, how do you automate? And that's a keyword and it's very related to our discussion today. So please feel free to reach out uh, for me on LinkedIn. That's where I'm usually active. With that, let's uh, kick this off. We have so much to talk about. All right, so for today, we're gonna start the discussion by talking about trends in general, right? Then we're gonna give some introduction about what has been happening in the world of AI for the past uh, three months. We will then dig into the details, right? We're gonna give an example and see what does that mean to us in the cybersecurity slash cloud sphere? How can we make use of this? What effect will that have uh, on us? All right, so with that, if we are if we are looking at if we are to look at the different uh, trends that have been happening over the past uh, ten or fifteen years or so, we would notice that there are a few things that made the news, and there was always a hype around them. So think about smartphones, for example. Think about the cloud, right? But these these topics usually happen. Not all of them actually end up being huge. Sometimes there is this overhype. And sometimes for some technologies, we still yet to see the effect. So I think about blockchain, for example, but then for others, they really, really hit. So think about the cloud as an example, right? When we first got to the cloud, um, the cloud allowed us to do a lot of things. It, uh, it created a lot of opportunities for us. So many people are creating things faster, et cetera. At the same time, it also introduced new security risks. We all remember those public buckets, right? Um, at the same time as well, it also, it also created new opportunities. But because there's a need for security, that means there's something for us to do, security professionals, right? This is something that we need to learn, and we continue to learn, and we continue to develop and basically make the cloud more secure. So that's an example, right? There was also, as I was doing this research, funny enough, I came across this funny uh, title. Uh, it's the one that's kind of in yellow on the, on the bottom right. It says the internet spa, right? Um, and it basically says hype alert. The gist of it is that the internet is not going anywhere. This was written in 1995. It basically says the internet is not going to be used for communication. It's not going to be used for um, for conferences, et cetera, et cetera. How wrong that, that was, right? Okay, so with that, that leads us to the current trend. So the current trend that we have, uh, which we all are aware of, chat GPT. And the, the obvious thing, ChatGPT is very, very impressive, right? Um, and the argument I will be making throughout this class is that ChatGPT is very impressive. It's still at early stages, but it's not where the focus should be, right? This is an example. ChatGPT is, uh, is just one application that can be uh, written. Um, and I'll give you an example of what I mean. So check this out, right? This is, um, this is a question that I posted uh, two days ago to ChatGPT, and it asked it a relevant question to what we do in cybersecurity, right? I said, hey, uh, can you use AWS CloudWatch Insight query uh, to create one that looks for communication for this malicious IP? Now, CloudWatch is an AWS service, and it is used basically to collect logs, uh, run searches on them, create dashboards and alerts, much like a, like a basic SIM, if you want. This is the response that I had from ChatGPT. And uh, let's, let's take a look at a few things. The first thing to notice is that there's a lot of words in here, right? And it's also not that accurate. It is impressive because this is the actual correct syntax. Oops, sorry about that. This is the actual syntax, right? Uh, a call watch query for those of us who have used it, starts with fields. So you decide on the fields that you need uh, and then you filter down. Uh, so it is impressive in that sense. It is obviously not Java. I'm not sure why it's saying Java in here. And look at that. There are other things. When I say communication with or communicated with, 
it actually understands that it needs to look at source IP addresses and destination IP addresses, and it has an OR in between. So that is impressive. What is not so impressive though, is that in CloudWatch, well, this is network, so this is VPC flow. VPC flow doesn't have something called source IP address. Rather, it has something called SRC IP ADD, ADDR, right? So that was a mistake. Now, that is due to the limitations of uh, chat GPT. And often when we have a discussion about chat GPT, this is where some of the conversations would end. And you would say, oh, chat GPT is not accurate. This result cannot really be used. It's useful, right? I need to make some edits, but, it, but I cannot take it as it is and then go with it. And this is where the discussion today is going to be. See, the thing is, OpenAI allows us access beyond chat GPT. It opens up their own APIs, which means we can communicate with these models and then we can create our own things. You can make changes to this. You can give instructions to chat GPT itself to kind of fix these changes. So for example, you can tell it, hey, it's not source IP address, it is SRC, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then it will fix this. But that defeats the purpose because now I am trying to teach chat GPT what is the right syntax is. Now, that's not what we're going to do. We're going to see how we can address this issue and if this issue is actually uh, can be fixable. Before that, let's cover some of the terminology that we have. So if you go to the uh, documentation of OpenAI, all of this text is basically from there. They define GPT as a set of models, so not one model, it's a set of models that understands and generates natural language. The generation part is great, right? It generates this human-like um, text. Understanding, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go with understand because it does understand to some degree, but it doesn't have comprehension, right? If an AI model tells you that I love you, it doesn't really loves you. It just, it just uh, it doesn't understand what it's talking about yet, right? So far. But let's say we're gonna we're gonna go with that. We're gonna go with the understand thing, and that's key for what we're about to do. Text Da Vinci Three is one of these models, and it's a very comprehensive one, and it's the model that we will be using again because we have direct access to it. There is also this concept of fine tuning. Now. Remember, what we're trying to do is curate this output that we get from something like ChatGPT so that it serves a specific purpose that we have. Within the fine tuning, there are two concepts that are important for us to understand. The first one is the prompt. Well, that is the question that we are pasting. That is what we're sending the AI model. And then there's the completion, which is basically the answer. And we wanna curate these two things so that we end up with the results that we want. All right. So how do we do this? Well, the first step is to gain access to the uh, OpenAI um, uh, APIs. And we do that by using a key. That key can be generated once you create an account with OpenAI. So you go, you log in, you create an account, you, you, set the, you, you create that key and then you can use it. Now in the documentation, uh, you can do something like this. So export the OpenAI key, that's you saving this in an environment variable. Now, is this really a good idea? Probably not. In fact, in SIC 540, we have a whole section about secret management, and we basically show you how not to do this. But for the sake of testing, this is fine for now. Once you have the key, you can use any tool you like to communicate with the API, so curl as an example, and you can see that you basically set um, curl to, to their endpoint, and you use your key for authentication, and then you're sending a bunch of parameters, right? Most importantly, what is the model that you want to use? You will not find ChatGPT here. You will find things like DaVinci 3, as an example. You can also send, you should also send the prompt. This is basically the question that you have. There are other parameters as well that you can set. Temperature is an interesting one. It basically helps you kind of tell the model how much risk it should be, how much creative it can get. So zero means do not be creative. Give me precise answers as much as possible, right? Now, once you do that, that's good. You can communicate with that. You can also take advantage of the OpenAI tools. So you can install this uh, suite of tools that can help us tune and work with the, with the API. So check this out. This is how we can actually tune uh, these, uh, these models. So the first step 
is that we want to teach this Da Vinci model. What is it? What is it exactly that we are looking for? One way. There are many ways to do that. One way to do that is to create a fine-tuned model, and we do that in few steps. The first step is to create a data, a tuning data file, and that file should be in JSON L, JSON long file, and it would be something like this. So it's an example, right? So who communicated with this IP address and the completion that I am looking for, the good example, if you will, is basically fields. I need to see the timestamp and the message, which is the entire log. And then I need you to filter based on source and basically equals, yeah, this is actually not accurate, but you get, you get the idea. And I need to give him, give it multiple examples. Openly, I recommend that we give them uh, that we give at least 200 examples. So it's a, it's a large file. Now, once you do that, you can basically create your own fine-tuned variation of the model using the OpenAI fine-tuned create command, right? Sounds good. You basically feed it the file and the base model. So that would be the Vinci 3, right? And then it will take some time. I did it yesterday and it took me a very long time, maybe like three minutes or so even though it used to take me like a few minutes. There is like a queuing system they have, et cetera. These are not the complete steps. There are other things, but this is the gist. Once that model is created, now we can use that. So check this out. Now we're basically sending a prompt and we're basically saying, fine, we're saying, we're saying use the model, not DaVinci 3, but our own fine-tuned model. All right, so sounds good. You can also do this via code, right? As part of that package, there is, a, there is Python support, Node.js, a bunch of others, I think, as well. And um, I will be using Python, but, ch but check this out. Now I can have my code to communicate with OpenAI APIs. So I import the OpenAI package library, and then I can basically say something like OpenAI completion create, which means that's a question I'm sending you and I need a response. And then I'm choosing the model and I'm choosing the prompt as, as well as other parameters as well. I can do that with multiple languages. All right, sounds good. So just a pause. I am looking at the questions and we will answer the questions at the end of the section. So bear with me because there is like a, little, a few things that I need to go through. It. But there is recording for this webinar. So you're good there. Okay. So, as you have already guessed, we will, we will use an example to kind of show how are we going to do that. Like this is the best way. This is what I like to do. Whenever I need to learn something new, I would come up with a project. Sometimes this project is completely useless, but it serves the purpose of learning. I need to try this. And as you have already guessed, the example that we're going to give is that, hey, we have CloudWatch and we need to create some sort of a Python code that will help the security analyst to, in, to, to interrogate CloudWatch for us. Um, if you think about the job of a security analyst or a, or a job of, the, of, of, a, of a hunter for threats, um, the job of a security analyst is basically to come up with questions and to translate these questions into, let's say, I don't know, some sort of a SIM language, a query language, so think of Splunk, uh, CloudWatch, Elasticsearch, whatever, right? These questions are designed to answer basically what happened? Do we have some sort of malicious activities? So questions would be, do we see communication with a malicious IP address, right, obviously? Um, when did these users log in or log out? And the, the answers to these questions will probably trigger other questions that we keep answering, we keep interrogating this SIM-like system until we get a clear answer, and then we can create a timeline of all of the activities that happened and we explain this incident. We say, oh, well, this is a false positive, or this is actually an incident, and this is what happened. This is how they managed to get access, uh, and this is what they got access to. So to do that, the analyst needs to know a bunch of things. Well, first of all, the analyst needs to be familiar with attacks, right? Um, it needs, the, the analyst needs to be familiar with the infrastructure, so that would be either cloud, maybe uh, on-prem systems, applications, et cetera. And then they also, on top of all of that, they need to learn how to use these tools. So they need to know to learn SPL, right? Splunk's language, or they need to understand how they, they run CloudWatch. On top of that, if they make a mistake, then they have to run that equation again. 
So this might actually be useful. So to do that, this is the high level architecture of what we are about to develop. So check this out. This is a, the human asking the code, hey, I need to see who's communicating with this IP address. Now, Python code is just code. It doesn't understand this, but it has the power of open AI, right? It can reach out to power AI and it should be able to ask it something like, hey, translate what this human needs. What's it, what is it exactly that they're asking for? Open AI should be able to respond with a precise query that works. It shouldn't say something like, uh, if you need to query CloudWatch, go to this, do this, et cetera, et cetera. It should be very precise. It should be very accurate, which is another issue that we have with ChatGPT, right, accuracy. And it shouldn't have any mistakes. Uh, and you can already tell that this can be a little bit tricky, but the response should be something like this. When you have something like this, that is very accurate, well, that is something that you can automate, right? That is easy after that. That is just basic automation. Now the Python code could use something like um, CloudWatch, uh, some, sorry, something like Boto3 to communicate with the AWS APIs, CloudWatch service, and then say, hey, give me the logs that respond to this specific query. Logs would then be sent back to the code and then, the, and then our Python code would basically send it back to the security analyst. Sounds good? Easy enough, right? There are a few things to notice here. One question that I got a lot, what about privacy concerns? Well, I have a question for you guys. And uh, do you have, in this scenario, have we shared the logs with OpenAI? That's a very important question because when you first think about it, the first thing to, to, to basically say is, hey, am I going to expose my data? And in this scenario, we're not exposing the logs. However, there's a caveat, we are exposing the queries, right? So for example, if we have usernames, if we're asking about the activities of usernames, uh, that will be shared with open eyes. So there's something to, to consider over there. Okay, I think enough slides. How about we go and actually see how this actually works? So I'm gonna switch my screen now and go show you an example. Then we're going to go back to the slides to continue, uh, but let's, uh, let me do this. I'm gonna flip, no, not the screen. Sorry about that. My cursor is there, there you go. Okay, I got it. All right, so I hope this is clear for everything. If it's big enough, you guys can see it, but I have focused. All right, so check this out. This is my code, right? And I'm gonna feed it some sort of uh, query. Let me actually feed it another one. I've done this like this morning. The one thing to notice about, uh, that I have noticed about the OpenAI um, API is that it's not very stable. I think they got too much traffic. They didn't anticipate it. It is getting better, but sometimes it's slow and sometimes it's a bit finicky. It doesn't always work, but I have already asked the, uh, the uh, demo gods to help me with this. So it seems like it's working, check this out. So you can see the output and you can already see uh, this. You can already see, oh, it's done. The output from OpenAI. This is the actual output that got. And you can notice a few things. This was fast. It's not, it's not super slow. It's still, there's still a delay, but it's actually fast. And it's actually very precise. So I asked it for the last event that the admin did. In this case, admin is a user. And this basically communicated to a testing account that I set for this purpose. And that testing account doesn't have much and we read data, but it has some activities that I have done. And I will share more about that, but check this out. This, this actually, this result is being used with CloudWatch to basically present certain data. Now, this is the output from CloudWatch. It's in, uh, you, you, can, you can tell that it's kind of formatted a little bit weird and I did that on purpose. The one thing that is strange is that even though the query says limit one, I have two logs, I'm not sure why, I'm gonna troubleshoot that later on, but check this out. The, the query says, show me the timestamp, show me the username and the source IP address, etc. Now, look at this, this is the timestamp and it is separated by a tab. That's how I designed the code, right? To be a little bit readable. This is the user admin. This is an IP address. This is the actual event. All of these fields are actually extracted from the message itself. All right, can I, can I, change, can I change this a little bit? 
I have another example. Let's uh, see. Uh, do not show me the message, right? Because this is too much information. And uh, let's give it a little bit of time. So check this out. Uh, this is the OpenAI work. And then there's a loop because you run the query and then you have to wait for the query to run inside CloudWatch. Once that is done, it will spit out the results. So check this out. So now we have admin, uh, the, the fields, all of them are organized. This is like easier uh, to read. All right, so let me pause for a minute and see if there's a question I can ask quickly. Okay, I can see a question from Marcus and Marcus is asking, can I use pl placeholders for usernames, etc., to kind of avoid this? Yes, so you can absolutely do that because this is your code, right? In fact, it's interesting that you asked this. Do you see this IP address? Not a real IP address. That's actually an IP address. That actually my code changing that so that I protect my own IP address from being visible. Does that make sense? So you, yes, absolutely, you can do that. All right, so this is nice, but it's um, it's kind of command line, right? Would it be nice to add a, a UI to this? I think that would be that might be a good idea. Um, so let's check this out. I have created another version of this, and in this version, let me just make this in a second. All right. In this version, um, well, uh, it takes some time to run a query. So let's run a query and then I'll explain what this application is in a second. So should we ask the same question again? Um, so what was the last um, event the admin did, right? And then you can see the go button. And if you hit enter, it will basically tell you, hey, hold on, I'm, I'm looking into this. Uh, I'm going to find that. Okay, so while this is working, let's talk about this for a second. This is an HTML uh, page, a static HTML that is hosted inside an S3 bucket. And um, there is some JavaScript inside. This is the JavaScript is actually what is moving this up. Oh, it's already got the results. Now the JavaScript reaches out to a backend AWS API endpoint. That endpoint will take this request and then will send it back to a Lambda function. The Lambda function is very similar to the code I showed you, to the Python code I showed you earlier. So now I've taken this code, instead of running it locally, I can have it in a serverless platform, right? And now that Lambda will communicate with OpenAI, will get the query, and then will communicate with CloudWatch, and then will run the query, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's take a look at the output. This is nicer. It's basically exactly the same output. It's, it's an exactly the same field. And that's as a result of that temperature, because when you set that temperature to zero, it will always try to be persistent. Okay, so sounds good. So um, what other questions should we ask? Let's try something like network traffic, right? So let's do something like uh, show me network traffic. Well, just very generic. And as it is working, let me scroll through the questions. I know I said I'm gonna answer the questions later, but I see a lot of them. So let me see. Uh, Troy is asking, how will our cyber criminals adversaries leverage this functionality? We will talk about this, Troy. Give me like a few minutes. Um, it's not directly the, um, um, the topic of this discussion, but we will touch on it towards the end of this, uh, of this discussion. All right. Oh, okay. So results are back. I will try to answer all the questions, I promise you. Okay. So uh, check this out. So this looks different, right? So check, check this out now, source address, source port. It already figures out what are the different ports that you might be interested in. So it didn't just send you a message, but that isn't something that it did on its own. I actually showed it that. I kind of trained it to say, hey, based on my personal experience, these are the events that people are interested in, in seeing. All right, no, I should move this, sorry guys. All right, sounds good. So check this out, there are IP addresses, source destination. This is interesting, the log stream, right? So let's uh, let's make change to this. So let's do show me only allowed traffic and let's see if this works, right? Now, the thing is I have so many examples to show you. And the, the reason why I wanna show so many examples is because I wanna point out where this succeeds and where it fails. Um, but unfortunately this takes a little bit of time and therefore I have screenshots. So I will move back to this and I will discuss all of these screenshots and I will be pointing out these things. Check this out. 
when I added show me only traffic, it actually created a, a filter. And the filter basically says action like accept, right? And then log stream like ENI, because that's that's basically how you filter for only network traffic, not other logs that you have. And look at that. So all of these actions are basically um, accepted. So let's do something else. Um, show me like an IP address maybe. So let's do this. Uh, set the traffic from this IP address. Let's see if this works. Now, most of the times I ran this was very consistent, but it did happen that at some points it would get a little bit confused. If it gets confused, it will give an error message saying either that I didn't find any logs or this uh, this query didn't really didn't really work. All right, so this is done. Um, is it? Let's see. Uh, yep. So source IP address. Yeah. So because I said from, it basically understood that as source IP address, and it's basically putting that source IP address in addition to the other logs as well. Okay. So let me. I'm going to take a look at the questions again, and then move back to the slides, and then talk about all of the different examples that they have. Um, so, uh, Faraz is asking, in your example, were you asking open to identify who communicated with this IP address? Would it ever be possible to access the data directly, not via the code? So, you want OpenAI itself to access your data? That is something that OpenAI should be, uh, should tell you if they want to do that or not. I don't think so. In the documentation that I read, they do not do that thing. And if I, I was in their place, I wouldn't do that either. Um, it's better for you to have your own code to do that just because of privacy, right? You do not want OpenAI to actually uh, do that for you. I hope that makes sense. All right, so let's go back. Uh, I'm gonna go back to the slides right here quickly. And let's talk about some of the examples. And I wanna point out a few things in here. So check this out. What logs do I have? Well, automatically, I would be pointing out the things that it actually got on its own and the things that I had to cure. So what log sources do I have? I didn't do anything with this. It automatically understood that you can separate the log sources via the log stream. And that is because the, the uh, GPT model, DaVinci 3, had some training. If you go and ask him any questions before my own tuning, it would actually know something about the CloudWatch uh, queries. So it could figure out that log stream is basically how you separate that, and it would give you all of the different logs that basically the system has. All right, so next you can specify some sort of a, of a log source. So you can say, show me the logs from this instance. This is an instance ID. And the default use is that the log group will be the instance ID, right? So it basically filtered log stream and it's basically showing you all of the logs that are coming from this specific uh, instance. All right, what next? Look at that. I can do something like, oops, there we go. So show me logs from CloudTrain. So I can be very specific, right? So that's the thing. You can be specific if you want to, if you know what you're looking for, or you can just ask your genetic and it will try to basically understand what you, what you meant. So now it's basically filtering for CloudTrain logs. So now I'm only seeing CloudTrain logs. All right, this is a question that we asked a similar one. What did the admin do? And it basically will filter and will understand that when you say admin, you're basically talking about the user and it will also know that the user is basically this is how you access it. user identity with a capital i username with a capital m it's very tricky again it has to be precise right this is something that i had to teach it so i had to actually give it all of the major uh fields that i'm interested in so that it knows but i didn't i all all i said is basically if you're looking for a username this is how you find the username there is nothing that says username in the question itself, which is impressive. So check this out. I want to I wanted to sort this by service. By the way, all of most of these queries are queries that I ran as part of the testing. Not all of them, and I will get that into that in, a, in, a, in an example. Look at look at this. This is not really what I meant. I did ask it to sort it by service because I wanted to see what services the admin access. But it did exactly that. It said sort by event source, which is the service descending. Um, but that's not what I'm looking for. I don't want them to source. So I asked the question in a different way. I said count by service. Now that makes more sense. If, uh, if you guys have used Splunk, this makes perfect sense, right? So count by this specific event source. 
I said service, but it did understand that service means event force. And these are the services that the admin accessed and there is a count next to them. You could ask it to basically sort this uh, ascending or descending if you want. I can also ask the question in a different way. So show me the services that the admin accessed. Let me go back in slides, one more slide back. So look at that. This is not really the same thing, but the output is the same thing, right? What, what I'm asking for is the same thing. So sometimes you can, you just need to ask it in a different way. Again, same result. All right, check this one. I asked it for the changed that were, uh, for the resources created or changed by the admin. And it's automatically, so past tense doesn't matter, right? It knows that the command is not past tense. And it also knows that the command starts with a capital C. This is not something that I told. It figured this uh, on its own. So it basically filters for create and change commands. There could be others. So this might not be 100% accurate, uh, but you guys get the, the idea. All right, let's see. So next we have uh, show me the services admin access, and then I'm giving more instructions. So count by event name and service, and this is exactly what it did. Now this requires some knowledge, right? I need to know what I'm looking for. So event and source name, and it did the count based on the event name and the event source. All right, let's see what else we have. So where what IP addresses did the admin log in from? I tried so many examples of different ways of asking the same question. So who logged in? Where did they log in from? What IP address did they use? There was like a million ways to ask the questions. And I would say for the most part, it worked. There were a few queries that got uh, confused. But check this out. It actually figured that login means console login. Now that might, that might not be what you're looking for, but that's basically in AWS, the event that someone logs in, that means you're using the console to log in. Uh, that could be not everything that you're looking for, but it's basically listing the IP addresses, right? I didn't tell it to source or uh, or count by do any type of stats, but it knows to list IP addresses. If it didn't, you can always add instruction in here. All right, let's uh, take a look at some uh, other things. So activities that by the admin from this IP addresses. So we have multiple conditions. So look at that. Uh, IP addresses and username like sort. All right, so check this out now. So I am being more precise. So the uh, IP address count by service, event name and source by count. That's another example, right? This is network uh, related. So I'm saying show me blocked traffic on specific ports. And now it knows that it's going to look for a different type. So let me go back actually. So all of these fields, are kind of similar because this is related to CloudTrail. I'm gonna go forward. These fields are completely different because now I'm interested in network traffic and it knows based on a few examples that I gave uh, in the training that this basically requires you to look at different fields that you're interested in, network fields, right? So it's sorting, it's basically saying accept and it did not accept so because it's blocked and it's basically saying destination port is this one. We can make this more complicated. This is actually impressive. I was, I was really impressed by this. Check this out. I'm saying show me network traffic on port 443 and 80 where source is not this IP address. Now there's an and, but it is smart enough to know that this and doesn't actually mean and in the query, it actually means or. Because I'm looking at, I wanna see both. I do not wanna see one field that has both. Now, when, I was starting off as a security analyst, I would make this mistake as a human all the time, right? It's interesting that this AI um, model doesn't make this mistake. It also knew that there's a relationship, right? So it has the destination port and a group together, and there's an and condition with the other uh, source related condition, right? So this is very impressive. And I have not given it any example that looks anything like that. It just figured out on its own. That's pretty cool. Um, these are kind of messed up, apologies for that, but basically I'm trying to make it a little bit more complicated. So for two, I have two ports and I have two IP addresses. Again, that's basically saying uh, not like this IP addresses. It's not like this IP, IP addresses either. So this is an end and th this is an end between the two IP addresses. 
and then another end between the group of source port of, of uh, source uh, and this sorry of destination ports. All right, let's see. So um, uh, let's take a look at this. So a very similar question. Now I'm basically saying count by service. This is also impressive. I asked it to count by the source, right? But in the actual query, it's actually counting by two by the source IP address. That's how it translated source to be. And it's also counting by destination. And if I have to guess, it did this, even though I didn't ask for it, because I am interested in the destination ports, because I'm mentioning the destination ports as well. So it's kind of figured that I also want to see the destination ports. I can instruct it to remove that if I want to. Okay. So all of the previous examples were testing that I was doing. But then I have my own style of questions. So I asked other people to create other questions. So I created this game, right? This is a testing AWS account and I hacked into it and all of it is logged. And I basically created some sort of like a, like a fun small CTF type thing. And then I asked friends and colleagues, many people at SAMS uh, to basically go and give it a shot, see how that works for them. So one of the people who work at SAM actually, uh, Joe Winagan, um, he actually went through it all and he spent like uh, maybe a couple of hours or so interrogating the system, asking questions, and he actually found, did manage to find the echo. He's the only one, by the way. So Joe, you earn uh, bragging uh, rights for that. But these are some of the questions that he asked, right? And remember, this is someone who doesn't know what the system is. They're trying to, all, all I said is try to find the hacker, right? So they didn't have the knowledge of how this works the way I do. So their questions is different. And I picked up like three or four examples to show you here. So check this out. This is one of the questions that Joe asked. So are there any particular AWS servers that are being used more frequently than others? Well, that's interesting. The system did not get this right. I had to actually go and fix it. I had to teach it that when someone is asking about a frequency, more or less, that is that means sort and then count descending or ascending. Uh, so after I fixed it, it actually can give you now, if you ask the same question or something similar, it will actually give you uh, all of the different log sources that a specific uh, service, etc. All right, so check this out. Now, Joe asks, ha have, have there been any recent changes to the AWS configuration? Now, it translated the changes as create an update. There is another example that we gave that is very similar uh, to that, right? Again, this might not be 100% accurate. It might not cover all of the changes. There could be, for example, put bucket. Maybe you want to consider that as a change or put object in a bucket, uh, but that needs some, some review. Check this out. This is very interesting, right? Joe is thinking about this as an actual person. So he's asking, can you identify any anomalies in AWS log that might indicate a problem. And let me pause here for a second. As of now, the system cannot do that. This message, I cannot do that. That's, that's, I, I, that's something I added. But if you really think about it, this is actually the natural evolution of a solution like this. This is where we want this to be in, I don't know, in the future, right? Uh, we want it to be able not to only answer questions or translate the questions, but we also want it to be able to come up with the questions as well. So let's go back to the definition of what a security analyst does. The security analyst comes up with questions. They ask these questions to some solutions and then they get the, the, the results back. Based on the results, more questions are being prompt asked, right? And that's exactly what a, what a text model does. It generates text. So it predicts what is going to be the next set of words or characters and it generates that. So does that mean that we can actually have an AI model in the future that will ask a question and based on the result or based on the answers, it will actually generate the next question and therefore run through an entire investigation by itself. That could be possible. We'll see how that, uh, how that goes. All right, so I think I have a couple more. So check this out. Uh, I am roles, user or role that is responsible for like whatever changes. And then it could identify user identity ARN. Again, this is not that impressive because I already told it that this is where you find uh, the, the roles. I might, I might not have specified that this is a role, but I did explain the ARN. 
So now it's basically showing me all of the roles and what are the roles that are basically uh, doing the most activity. All right, our final example, this is uh, an example of a, of a good professional use of this, because this is an analysis, this is also Joe, who knows what that app. So at this point, Joe was closing in on what actually has happened. And now he's familiar with what's going on and how to use this. So it knows how to create queries, how to custom these queries exactly to what they need. So check this out. So it's basically asking, this is the entire question. So show me um, potential uh, attacks, log stream, this so it's specifying the actual log stream. And Joe is using the actual language. He could have said just the instance, uh, such as request, and then it's giving a bunch of things. So 169, uh, command injection, reverse shell syntax, netcat, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the result from OpenAI. It might not be like 100% accurate, but this actually works. And it works because of this. 169, what is that? I'm pretty sure some of you guys know what this is. Um, so that is one of the attacks that we actually talk about in, in many cloud classes, uh, especially 588, which is a pen testing one. And if you create an instance, there is the metadata of this instance. Um, and that's a URL that you can access via curl. And you can hit this URL internally from the instance to fetch certain information, including access keys. Right, and that's a different topic. But this URL starts with one six nine, so that's what Joe is trying to figure out. He's looking for anyone who accessed this, and in fact, he found a hit. This hit is a false positive because this is something else. This is uh, coming from SSHD, someone on the internet trying to connect to my open public SSH instance. Right, um, so this is not exactly what he's looking for, but he did manage to find what what he's looking for. All right, let me pause and see if there are other questions that I can answer. Um, let's see. Um, William is asking, in the network automation, will GPT 3.4 and 4 react the same way to check using Ansible? William, I'm not sure what, are you, what, do, what do you mean by using Ansible, but 3.5 is what we currently have, right? That is GPT 3.5. Four is supposed to be like, so many times much, much faster. Um, but I expect that they would react the same way to the APIs. If, you're, if you mean using Ansible to run APIs, then it should be the same way. Now, one thing to remember, the offering that OpenAI has as of now is not yet final. So we don't really know how this is going to change in the future. And that includes pricing features and other things. Also, remember that Microsoft invested a lot in OpenAI. And now Microsoft is having their own uh, and having access is giving you access to OpenAI uh, API as part of their own uh, API suite. So as part of Azure, that's another reason to watch out for Azure, right? There will be other companies as well. Um, all of them, Google, Amazon, they all have their, their own things as you all know. And soon OpenAI is not going to be the only one. It's just we're giving an example of OpenAI because that's what we have. Right now. All right, so um, let's see. We have, we're almost done. But if I am to summarize what, the, what is the message that I'm trying to get here, uh, I would say OpenAI using abstraction. So they created this layer of abstraction. They provided AI as a service. And by doing that, they broke the boundary of us having access to AI. Because previously, if you, are, if you had to do something like this, if you wanted to do something like this, you had to be an expert on AI. If you look at the code that we, uh, that we looked at uh, together, we didn't really have to be experts. I actually forgot to show you the actual codes. Uh, I'll see if I have, I'll go back to the function and show you a few things in a minute. But they basically broke that barrier. That will definitely introduce new security challenges. So many of you are asking about IP addresses, privacy, can attackers actually uh, utilize this? And the answer is yes. You will have smarter malware. You could have some sort of a malware that lands on my laptop, and then it automatically decides what IP addresses to scan, um, how to jump from one system to the other, what exploits it should get. If it doesn't have that package of the exploit, maybe it will ask questions to some backend system that will automatically create or change 
specific exploit and then send it to that malware. And then now you have a live malware that actually makes decisions as it goes. And you could have something like this in the future. Well, no, we'll see. But that also creates opportunity. And I think of two types of opportunity. The opportunity of us learning how to secure the AI models themselves, right? So if everyone is using AI, if all the applications have AI embedded, you probably want to understand what are the security concerns, how we can fix that, uh, et cetera. Same thing with the cloud, right? You had public buckets, then you had to have people who understand how to fix these security issues. The second uh, thing is that this actually allows us, uh, gives us an opportunity to build our own tools, which is uh, what we have been doing, right? To build our own tools that would make our life much easier. All right, so with that, you have noticed that link, that page I showed you is actually a public one. Uh, you can actually go ahead and interrogate it. And I will leave it online for a few weeks. We'll see how that goes. Um, give it a shot. It is not perfect. And you can actually try to interrogate it. And uh, it, is not, um, it, is, it is not safe from abuse. So you can actually try to interrogate it and find what type of instructions in there. But most importantly is that there is another hacker, different one than the one Joe identified. And I'll leave that up to you. Try to find it, see if you can actually find the IP address of that malicious actor. Um, see if you can find out what exactly happened, what is it that they hacked, what sort of level access that they got. But keep in mind some consideration. As of now, there isn't time search. So this doesn't understand time. And I will get to that, to why that is in a second. Um, but it's not supported yet. I will update that later on. Also, if you run a query and your it doesn't give you the exact answers, try to run something else. Try to run it to try it differently. One final thing is that this will truncate the data up to a certain point if you have a query that is very large. So if you run a query saying, "Give me all events in the system," that will be truncated at some point, right? Okay. So before I close. Let me go back and show you. Oops, that's not what I wanted to show. I want to actually show you pieces of the code because I think they might answer some of the questions. So this is not the exact code that I'm using, but it's an early version of it. And I want to show two functions in here. So the first one is get query, and this is basically how we're communicating with OpenAI. So check this out. This is the OpenAI library, completion create, and then you get to choose your model. You can choose DaVinci 3. You can choose your own person. This is how a personal model would look like. It will, uh, it, it will ask me for a name and the name I call it CloudWatch. It will add a timestamp and you can see that this was created a few days ago. And then you can use that. Um, you can also have it parameterized just for the sake if you want to do that. And then you can set other, um, other parameters as well. Once you do that, you can extract the actual response, which is the text field right here. And then you can feed that as a query to the next function, which basically reads these logs. And you can see that this actually works with bot of three. And it basically sends a query and basically says, starts a query. These are the log groups that you want. Now, these are, this is an old version. They're not hard coded as of now. Um, and then you give it a bunch of other parameters, including the query string, which is what, which was generated by OpenAI. The reason why this doesn't support time is that time in CloudWatch query is a little bit confusing because you have to give it the start and the end time, not as part of the query, but as part of a, of a separate parameter. And it is an epoch time. So that adds complexity. Um, and I'm working on that. And uh, I think I figured out how to fix this, but we'll see. If I couldn't fix it soon enough, I'll just add some sort, of, some sort of an option that you would just choose the time manually and we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so with that, let me go back to the slides and I have a few more things to share. Where do we get more information? Well, at SANS, we have a bunch of cloud classes. As I told you before, the class I teach is the SIC 540. This is the flight plan, which has a lot of classes. Um, this is not a promise, but maybe we'll have something about OpenAI in the future. Who knows, right? The class that I actually teach is 540. And if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, I will be in Baltimore in a couple of weeks, in New York City in July, and in Chicago in August. This class talks about cloud security. So we cover AWS and Azure. 
and it talks about automation and DevSecOps. So basically, if you are to run the cloud payloads, what type of security you want to have and how? So if you imagine a pipeline and you're basically automatically pushing deployments through that pipeline, what type of security you want to add? And this is what this class is all about. Also, Eric Johnson, who actually one of the author of the class I teach, SIG 540, is having a couple of sessions uh, this month. Uh, the first one is the breaking the cloud kill chain, which will happen on the on March the 21st. This is going to be a webcast. And then the second one will be a follow-up on our Discord uh, channel. Uh, this will be more of a more of a discussion uh, about what has been uh, discussed two days earlier. And then there would be a, a, a very interesting uh, demo. I would highly recommend that you guys attend both of these. All right, with that, thank you so much for listening. Let's uh, look at the questions. Um, Lara, any question that you want to bring up? There are like so many <laughs> scrolls. Um, let's about see. that I was uh, still on mute yes let's uh, start at the top there are so many we're probably not going to get through them all um, so I will work with Ahmed uh, to see if we could write a blog or something like that to get everything answered but let's go ahead and start um, in network automation will GPT 3.5 and 4 react the same as the chat GPT using Ansible yeah, so I talked about this one um, earlier. Um, and yeah, I think I answered the question, but basically the gist okay. of it is, yeah, so let, let, let's carry on to the next one. Perfect. Uh, in your example, where you're asking OpenAPI to identify who communicated with 195.45.2.44, would it ever be possible for OpenAPI to access the data directly? Example, not via code. Yeah. So I. I also touched on this a little bit, but let me add a few things in here. I think we do not want OpenAI to do that. And if I was OpenAI, I wouldn't want to do that because of privacy concerns. Is it possible? Technically, it is possible. Are they going to offer you this? I'm not so sure, honestly. Uh, however, there is something to also to keep in mind. As OpenAI integrates more with Azure, you already have your data in Azure anyways and you're trusting Azure anyways. And now if you have another application that is basically a part of it, then maybe, maybe that will change. And then now it will basically be like the same thing. So now OpenAI could have access to your data if you allow them to, or maybe without your consent, I'm not sure. But I hope that makes sense. Great. How will our cyber criminal adversaries leverage this functionality? Yes. So the example I gave was a malware, right? So a malware that is smart enough to generate um, to generate the next step. If you think about a malware now, it just runs with us, it, it gets downloaded, it tries few finite tricks. Um, so for you finite exploits, for example, and if it works, if it, it works, if it doesn't, then it fails. Now you can have a smarter one where it could have like four or five tricks up its sleeves, but then it has a whole back end of AI tricks, right? It can reach out and say, hey, this is not working. Do you have any other suggestions? And then the AI module behind that would tell it something like, um, why don't you try this new exploit, right? So that's one example. Another example is more on, is less sophisticated is that we're already seeing um, people trying to create malware using ChatGPT. So it's not that sophisticated, but ChatGPT will make it actually faster to write code, including malicious code itself. And you must have seen posts online of people tricking ChatGPT to bypass its own security control so that it can actually allows them to do that. Uh, and I think I, actually we had, uh, we had a session, um, I think it was last month about that exact thing. And we basically discussed that. I'll find the link and put it um, for you right here. Where we actually went using, we went through ChatGPT and we actually tried to create malware using. Great, we'll keep going. How's OpenAI connecting with CloudWatch? Where did you configure this? Okay, so yeah, anonymous attendees. So uh, OpenAI does not connect to CloudWatch. That's the job of my code. My code acts as, a, as an intermediate. 
it does two functions. It connects the co my code, connects to OpenAI, it retrieves the actual query, and then my code connects to CloudWatch because it has a set of credentials, has a set of keys that allows us access to that specific account. So there's like I am access control on top of that. The, the idea is that testing account is an account that I own and I want to give it and I want to give access to it to my code only. I don't want AI to be messing with it. All right. Can you go over again how you connected that web page to OpenAI? You mentioned an S3 bucket. Okay, that's an inter that's a very good question. So here's the architecture, and this is a typical serverless architecture. You have a bucket. In that bucket, you have HTML and JavaScript. That's the actual page. Now that bucket has is public is publicly accessible, and it acts as a static web page. That's a feature in AWS. You can set that bucket to serve as a web server. So you hit that bucket first, and your browser downloads this HTML slash JavaScript slash CSS, right? All of this page that you see. Inside that page, um, there is JavaScript that points to another API, not the OpenAI API endpoint, but another API endpoint that I created. It's, a, it's another service that is called AWS API Gateway, which allows you to create an API Gateway that receives requests. So get, post, what have you. The JavaScript on my browser will reach out to this endpoint, this API, and it will send the human request. That API uh, endpoint will communicate back to a Lambda within the same infrastructure. That Lambda is basically a Python code that receives parameters. And the parameters are basically some of the information that are included in the request that is coming. The Lambda would, would be triggered it will read these parameters coming from the API gateway. And that is basically the Python code that does the work. So that Lambda now communicates, does two things. Communicates to the OpenAI uh, API and pitches that query. And then at the, same, at the same time communicates to the CloudWatch using bot three to basically fetch the information. And then it will send it back to the API. From the API, it would go back to the JavaScript. The JavaScript would render the um, the information and it will give you that table inside the application uh, serverless architecture is a different thing but it's very interesting that you can do that very quickly wonderful can we teach open ai to teach to maintain context between the queries based on some labels within our use case uh let me read that again um so can we teach api um to teach maintain context between queries. Yes, you can do that. In fact, ChatGPT itself can actually relate. So you ask it a question, it will give you information. You ask it the next question, and then it will basically understand that there is a correlation between your first and second question. So yes, you can. This specific application doesn't do that yet, but it's definitely something you can. You can do way more than that, actually. Great. What is the source of this website from where it's getting data? Yes, so Fajr, as I explained in the previous question, there is a, a bucket, static websites. The source of the data is CloudWatch queries. So that's CloudWatch is an AWS service that has access to all of the logs. And you can access that via code um, and that basically will be, will be handled by that Lambda. Great. We are running out of time. We still have a lot of questions left. Okay. Ahmed, where can people reach out to you directly if they have uh, questions that have not yet been answered? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good question. So you can reach out via email. Actually, I'm going to get to the first slide. There you go. Or you can reach out on LinkedIn. So you can find me here, right? That's my personal email address. Um, it's very easy. My first name is my last name, even though my last name is a bit tricky. Uh, but then you can also search, you can also find me on LinkedIn and you can send me messages over. Perfect. Let's take one more question and then we will wrap up. Uh, let's see, the mentioned Python example, do you provide that, that on a GitHub repo? Can you share the link with us, please? I have an earlier version of this on a GitHub repo, but it's not perfect, doesn't have the latest. I will share some aspects of that. And then I will announce it on, on uh, LinkedIn. Perfect. 
All right. The other place that you can reach Ahmed is in our cloud security discord, which you can access through www.sansurl.com slash cloud dash discord. So, yep. Thank you for pulling that up, Ahmed, right there. And at this time, we will thank you for all attending and we will look forward to connecting in the future. Ahmed, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lara. Thank you, everyone. Um, and have a great day ahead. See you later.